All right, y'all. So thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Scott Tankersley. I use he, him pronouns. And I'm a housing subsidy program manager with the Healthcare Authority's Division of Behavioral Health and Recovery. Uh, like I said, thank you for joining us today. Uh, we're going to be reviewing the Foundational Community Supports Transition Assistance Program, otherwise known as TAP. And TAP successfully launched uh, last year on May 2nd, and uh, Foundational Community Supports supportive housing agencies have been steadily submitting uh, requests for reimbursement since. And so far, we've assisted over 1,000 individuals with lowering or removing uh, barriers to housing stability. And almost 500 of those folks that have access TAP have used it for move-in costs. So covering those first last uh, month's rent, security deposits, and non-refundable fees. Um, you know, that's really the aim of the FCS Transition Assistance Program. Um, you know, if an individual enrolled in FCS supportive housing, or if they are enrolled in the program, supportive housing program, and they're experiencing financial barriers to housing, TAP may be a tool to lower or remove those barriers. So that's, you know, essentially why I'm here. And some of you may be wondering, you know, why I'm here presenting this flexible funding program that only serves folks in the FCS supportive housing uh, program. And, you know, I think Don uh, mentioned it earlier, but I just want to reinforce, you know, we really feel that having an awareness about all the resources available via foundational community supports, and, and especially in the supportive housing program, you know, for the employment folks, we really think it can help enrollees and case managers better coordinate care. And, you know, many of the agencies uh, providing supportive housing services through FCS also provide those supported employment services as well. And, and, and those two services provide holistic support to individuals so that they can, you know, more easily obtain a home or a job that aligns with their preferences. And so since many of those agencies, you, um, you know, offer both of those programs, we really just want to be certain that folks working on the, the supported employment side know about TAP so they can better coordinate with the supportive housing service side. And while TAP is only offered to FCS supportive housing enrollees, you know, it's really, you know, about working together to identify housing related costs that may be a barrier so that supported employment case managers can really discuss the possibility of using TAP to cover any costs they may hear about on their side of the house. Um, and so with that said, at this point, well over half of the foundational community support, supportive, supportive housing providers have uh, you know, returned their TAP contract amendment to Amerigroup. That's really um, essential to, to an agency being able to access the TAP program. Um, you know, the agency would need to sign that contract amendment with Amerigroup so that the agency is able to access the funding. And once that amendment is received and processed by Amerigroup, your agency can use TAP, um, your, your, your supportive housing service agency can use TAP to assist the enrollees to make housing transitions. And with all that said, I'll be turning the slide soon, but you know, really what is TAP? And, and you know, I really like to define it as a flexible funding resource that aims to lower or remove financial barriers to affordable housing for foundational community support, supportive housing enrollees, behavioral health treatment needs. And, and the fund is administered by Amerigroup. Um, and it can be drawn upon by supportive housing providers, those FCS supportive housing providers, as FCS supportive housing enrollees take steps to achieve their individualized housing goals. But, excuse me for a moment. Uh -huh. Yeah, I believe, I believe you need to make either Darren or I a co-host to be able to watch the waiting room. Oh, let's do that. Yeah. Let Thank you. Sorry. No worries. Don, I'm going to make you a co-host, okay? Sounds good. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate it. All right, y'all. So moving forward, Happy New Year to everyone. I know it's kind of getting old probably to hear that, but it is still a new year, and I like to just to mention it. Um, with that, here is today's agenda on the screen. You're going to see us, you know, really rooting ourselves in the evidence-based practice of permanent supportive housing. Um, uh, you know, that's really essential to the, to the supportive housing program, so thereby it's really essential for TAP as well. I'll kind of walk through some of the partnerships that allowed TAP to, to, to become what it is, um, talk about, you know, the implementation of the program, and then start to talk about those eligibility pieces and the access points for the program. I'm going to do a really high overview of the steps to spend TAP funding, um, namely, you know, 
I know a lot of folks here are supported employment. Um, I felt like, you know, taking that 20,000 foot view um, is really where we need to be for folks to understand, the, you know, the process, but not all the details. And then the administration of the program, just gonna review some best practices and strategies, and then talk about some of the best practices and strategies within the services and, and how TAP can kind of function in that space as well. And then in the remaining time, I'll do a bit of a Q&A, okay? So with that, uh, you know, foundational community support, supportive housing services, like I said, are rooted in principles of permanent supportive housing, or PSH. And those appear before you on the screen. You know, <clears throat> each principle aims to empower individuals while, they're, while also aiming to bolster long-term tenancies uh, in housing. And so with these, um, these are really the critical core components or principles of PSH. Housing choice, you know, it's really critical that tenants have access to a range of housing options in their community. And if individuals are placed, and I use air quotes, in a setting that does not meet their needs or preferences, they're less likely to stay in the unit. And for this reason, you know, enrollee housing preferences should be explored as fully as possible. And, um, you know, scattered site housing oftentimes offers the best opportunity to meet an enrollee's housing uh, preferences, but local housing markets will dictate what's available at any given time. Um, separation of housing and services. You know, permanent supportive housing is most successful when there's a functional separation between a person's housing and support services. And so, um, you know, really we wanna see a separation between the housing management and the support service staff. Um, housing must be decent, safe, and affordable. Uh, you know, the housing is affordable based on a person's income and preferences of course, but you know, that 30% of adjusted income is where we hope that someone would be spending their, or, 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 or that's how much we hope someone would be spending um, you know, on their portion of rent. But oftentimes people who receive SSI or supplemental security income or other income support uh, you know, are spending far more than that on housing. So without housing subsidies oftentimes, or those longer term housing subsidy resources, many folks receiving income support can't, um, without those, people can't oftentimes uh, afford a place to call home. Community integration. So when people live in communities, they can build social support networks that help them and the people around them thrive. And you know, integration really describes the degree to which the person's housing is incorporated into the broader community. And housing should be in residential areas with mixed populations, uh, you know, in, 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 in diverse incomes in buildings and neighborhoods. Rights of tenancy, um, these are distinctly different from shelter or transitional program rules and regulations. Uh, residents should have full legal tenants rights according to federal, state, and local law. And housing should be permanent in the sense that the enrollee has a lease. And as long as they abide by that lease, they are able to stay in their home. Uh, access to housing, there should be not, uh, or there should not be any uh, preconditions to housing obtainment. Uh, there should not be any renter readiness screening or a service requirement. Rather, uh, achieving and sustaining tenancy is really the core goal and focus of, of uh, this type of housing. And then flexible voluntary services. You know, folks can refuse or accept services when they're offered, but service staff must continue to offer support and flexible engagement strategies. Uh, service type, location, intensity, and frequency of services should meet the tenant's needs and their preferences, even when they shift or change. And so while someone may not want services right away, there is a chance that they may want services down the line, and hopefully those are being offered to them. All right, so TAP wouldn't be possible without the Foundational Community Supports Provider Network. And this includes both the supportive housing and supportive, uh, supported employment services. Both benefits work together, like we've said a few times already, to provide holistic support as Medicaid uh, beneficiaries with complex health, and health needs seek housing and employment in communities across Washington. And while TAP only serves the supportive housing enrollees, FCS supported employment serves many recipients of the supportive housing benefit as well ultimately helping uh, enrollees obtain and maintain housing stability and financial security. ALTSA, or the Aging and Long-Term Service Administration over at the Department of Social and Health Services, or DSHS, is also a partner in the FCS program, but ALTSA also oversees a couple of housing subsidies and resources that have informed TAP's introduction into the housing resource landscape. And so I just wanna kind of tip my hat to them. 
Um, same with commerce. The Department of Commerce and several of their programs, including the CBRA program or the Community Behavioral Health Rental Assistance Program, has also played a pretty integral role in shaping TAP. Um, I've been working pretty closely with the Department of Commerce and ALTSA to align these resources as best as possible over time. Um, and also, uh, the Department of Commerce, there's a new program coming up and out uh, here pretty soon that involves FCS supportive housing, um, which is called Apple Health and Homes. And we're going to be collaborating quite a bit in that space as well. Um, and then DBHR's uh, fellow recovery support service programs like recovery homes and all the peer support services have really helped inform the potential for TAPS use in communities across Washington as well as the short-term uh, subsidy programs over here at the Division of Behavioral Health and Recovery. Uh, two of them in particular, one known as the Housing and Recovery Through Peer Supports Program, or HARPS, and then the Forensic Housing and Recovery Through Peer Supports Program, uh, FARPS. So Amerigroup uh, is a managed care organization who you are all are probably very familiar with at this point. Um, you know, the FCS program, they're the FCS program's third party administrator, and they play a really large role in maintaining the program and the provider network. Uh, they really work to improve the quality of the program and the systems that support it. And then Amerigroup also performs the critical tasks of collecting and reporting data and reimbursing providers for the funds they've spent on behalf of enrollees in the TAP program. And so TAP is a cost reimbursement program. I think it's really important to note that here because, you know, uh, FCS. Uh, service, services are paid through claims that go through uh, a Medi Medicaid clearinghouse. Uh, one thing I like to highlight is that TAP does not go through that clearinghouse. Uh, rather, it, the money sits at Amerigroup um, and, and they have uh, designated staff who disperse that money and review the requests for reimbursements and disperse it when, when, when they're approved. And so, you know, it's really important, I think, to understand that separation, um, and, and that really impacts how quickly we can we can get money over to providers. Um, as the third party administrator, you know, Amerigroup is each provider's contact for all matters concerning TAP funding, including the funding requests and reimbursements. And information on their processes, you know, I'll, I'll be briefly presenting that today. But Amerigroup hosts their own trainings on how to submit requests for reimbursement as well. Um, and I I'll mention a little bit more about this later, but today is actually uh, a day where they are providing a training, I believe at 1030 to 1130. Um, and that is because TAP, uh, the request form for TAP is going online, but more about that uh, coming up here soon. And so with that though, Amerigroup's FCS website contains program documents and they also provide uh, orientation and training support in relation to the broader FCS program as well as the transition assistance program as well. Like I said earlier, just one quick note, I'm gonna repeat it. You know, Amerigroup requires supportive housing providers seeking to serve uh, supportive housing enrollees with TAP funding to sign the contract amendment. It's really critical that these are signed and returned to Amerigroup prior to participating in TAP. So if your agency has not signed the TAP contract amendment, they will not be able to access the TAP fund on behalf of the supportive, uh, supportive uh, housing enrollees. Also, Amerigroup, when they when they send out those contract amendments, they send out an electronic fund transfer paperwork or, or EFT paperwork um, so that agencies seeking timely TAP reimbursements can receive those. Um, you know, I know that the EFT uh, system works in the FCS kind of realm more broadly. One thing that is worth noting is that if seeking to access TAP, you have to have a separate EFT uh, setup for, for TAP because they come from two different places. The funding comes from two different places. And so uh, just keep that in mind as you, if you have not been communicating with Amerigroup, if you are going to start using TAP, you need to contract, you know, sign the contract amendment. And then if you'd like the most timely payments or reimbursements, you'd have to sign up for a new EFT program. So TAP funds were born in the state legislature via the state general fund uh, in the 2021-22 biennium. And about three million per fiscal year was appropriated for for um, um, for those first two years. Uh, I monitor the program and collaborate with providers and stakeholders to ensure TAP functions appropriately across the state. And then Amerigroup is contracted by HCA to administer the funding. And so ultimately, like ultimately, like I said, they review provider spending and reimburse the dollars when they've been spent properly, and pay, um, you know they'll pay on behalf. I'm sorry, when they've been spent properly and paid on behalf 
of an FCS supportive housing enrollee. So they're really the go-to for that reimbursement. Um, FCS supportive housing providers represent an array of community-based organizations like healthcare providers, uh, BHAs or behavioral health agencies, and long-term service care providers across the state who are serving a diverse population of enrollees with a supportive housing benefit. So data from the providers will is basically passed to Amerigroup through that request for reimbursement. And then this data comes to me, uh, it's compiled by them and then comes to me and then I write a report and send that out to the legislature. Um, and I report about how and, and who accessed the funding and what they used it for. So with that, we're gonna jump into a little eligibility piece here. So who is eligible to access TAP? Um, an individual must be actively enrolled in FCS eligible Medicaid. So they have to have that RAC code and they should be connected to Medicaid. And they must be authorized by Amerigroup to receive FCS supportive housing services. Uh, the enrollee must identify as having a behavioral health treatment need, but validation or verification of behavioral health treatment need is not required uh, to access the TAP fund. Um, so basically, folks who are already enrolled in FCS supportive housing, according to provider one, um, that may, basically makes them eligible to access TAP, so long as that they are showing up in provider one on the date of the proposed payment as connected to FCS supportive housing. So that provider one piece is truly essential, okay? The screening or approval process is basically performed by the provider themselves based on, on what they see in provider one. And so since a person must be actively receiving FCS supportive housing eligible Medicaid at the time of the transaction or service, providers must check this before spending TAP funds, okay? So the next two slides review the process steps for spending TAP funding, documenting payments, updating enrollee files, and requesting reimbursement from Amerigroup. Um, you know, after these two slides, I'm gonna, I'm gonna touch on some of the people that's involved. Um, Hi, Michelle, I see that you're off mute. Just wanna let you know, I don't know if you planned on that. Um, so with that, I'm gonna just kind of walk through these steps real briefly. Um, you know, step one is what we were basically just kind of touching on, right? Checking Medicaid, um, checking the Medicaid status in provider one to ensure the enrollee is receiving FCS eligible Medicaid. Uh, you know, if an enrollee is seeking to use TAP funds and they are actively receiving FCS eligible Medicaid, move on to step two. If not, then that case manager and provider um, would not move forward to access TAP, okay? So step two is to review the TAP quick reference guide. If an item is listed on the document, TAP funds can be spent up to the amount listed. If the item is not listed or it is listed, but the cost is over the amount listed, an exception to policy or ETP request um, must be submitted to Amerigroup. Uh, providers will stop here and await word from Amerigroup before moving to the next step if they're using the ETP request process. So step, steps one and two are really crucial because they help providers determine if and when TAP funds can be spent. And I'd like to highlight that Amerigroup will be checking to see if the person was actively receiving FCS eligible Medicaid for each and every transaction. And they will be confirming that the cost listed in the quick reference guide, um, you know, is at that amount or under that's listed on the quick reference guide. And then, you know, reimbursements may be denied by Amerigroup if providers must spend TAP funding because funds were spent outside of the program guidelines. I always just want to highlight that. Okay, so that quick reference guide is really essential. Um, and if not, that exception to policy process is also really essential, seeking to spend kind of outside the parameters of that sheet. Okay, and so step three is to, step, to spend the TAP funding up to the approved amount listed on the quick reference guide or the ETP approval from Amerigroup. Okay, and so providers wouldn't take this step if, if the um, you know, ETP was denied or, um, or if, they've been, yeah, if they've been informed by Amerigroup that their exception to policy has been denied, okay? So then you'd want to document spending. You know, documentation is critical and there are several documents to update after spending TAP funds that we'll review. Uh, these steps help ensure reimbursements run smoothly. And essentially, if all steps are followed correctly by providers, then spending and reimbursement should flow without any hiccups, okay? And then step five, we'd want providers to update an enrollee's housing treatment plan or housing goal plan. And then step six, submit the TAP request for reimbursement sheet to Amerigroup. 
Um, you know, right now that sheet is being submitted by providers on Thursdays to Amerigroup at a particular email address, which I'll share a little bit later in the presentation. Um, I also mentioned this earlier. I'll mention it a few more times today as well. We have a uh, uh, transition coming up here to an online platform for TAP. And today is one of the uh, trainings for what that platform is going to look like. Um, there's another one next week as well. And I have the dates here in the slideshow that we'll get to here in a few moments. Okay, and then step seven would be reimbursement, um, you know, would be arriving within 30 days from any request. Uh, typically re arrives quicker if your agency participates in that electronic uh, fund transfer system or EFT system. So, you know, making timely payments can be critical for obtaining housing and oftentimes making timely payments um, can make or break the chance to obtain a housing opportunity for, for someone. And so, you know, the TAP, the TAP, Quick Reference Guide offers providers information about when they can move forward to cover a cost without prior approval from Amerigroup um, so that those timely per, uh, payments can be made. Um, and so with that, you know, if that person is seeking coverage for one of the funding categories that you see on this screen, you'll see what items could be covered and up to what amount, okay? And uh, one thing I like to mention about this space, you'll see, um, you know, the max spending for TAP funding is 5000 per year. Um, I like to call that a rolling year or a rolling authorization for up to that amount. And so what that means is if today I needed as an enrollee to spend $1,000 and that uh, provider was able to um, provide or, or request that for me, I could spend that $1,000. I would still have $4,000 left for the remaining or the remainder of the year to spend. And once a year later comes around for from that, you know, when I spent that $1,000, that 1,000 would drop off my my record. Okay, and so then I would have that amount left or or, or be back up to $5,000. Okay, and so basically that's kind of how it rolls forward. Is as someone continues to spend, that amount is subtracted from their annual amount, but from the date of a payment one year out, that amount will drop off their record. So the exception to policy process allows for TAP to be flexed to cover housing related costs that fall outside of the rules of the quick reference guide. Uh, many times barriers to housing stability are unique to an individual. That said, many, fun many funding programs don't offer assistance to help lower or remove these barriers. And so Funding resources oftentimes only cover certain rent costs or items, and TAP aims to meet folks where they are and address uh, barriers that are unique to them. Uh, and that's what the ET pro ETP process or exception to policy process really provides is that space um, to flex the funding in a more unique way or outside of the box way. Um, so to admit, submit an ETP, providers submit the same request for reimbursement form to Amerigroup. So it's the same spreadsheet, just a little uh, more uh, marking up to do on the spreadsheet and a little bit more information. Um, and then Amerigroup reviews that uh, and, and you know they determine if it will be approved, rejected, or denied. There are certain times when things will come my way for review, and that's because I have it set up so that if uh, you know a certain amount is requested or certain items are requested, then we review together. So currently requests for reimbursements are submitted on a spreadsheet. Like I said, uh, basically every Thursday they're submitted by providers and this form goes to Amerigroup and it's reviewed by Joe Elder um, and, and Joe's the TAP manager over at Amerigroup. He processes the requests within five business days and ETPs are processed within 10. Okay, so keep that in mind, just a little bit change of a shift in the timeline if it's a ETP. And as TAP continues to grow as a program, so do the number of weekly reimbursement requests submitted to Amerigroup. You know, um, with that, Amerigroup is automating TAP. So therefore, TAP is transitioning to that online uh, platform, similar to the assessment. Um, the current launch date for the online platform is February 16th, but we're keeping that a bit flexible. And Amerigroup is providing online trainings on how to use this new platform. One of those is today, like I mentioned, uh, from 1030 to 1130. Um, the second training will be held Thursday, January 24th from 2 to 3 p.m. And uh, we can get you that link uh, or Amerigroup can get you that link if needed. Um, if you're unable to attend but need this information, you're always welcome to reach out to Amerigroup and I'm sure their staff, Joe being particular, the, the person that you would be connecting with, would be happy to you know, review the online platform once it's launched with you. 
Um, you know, transitioning to this online platform will make it so FCS supportive housing providers don't have to only submit reimbursement requests on Thursdays. And so once that platform launches, providers will be able to submit TAP requests at any time. Um, if you have questions about TAP reimbursement requests, including how to use the new online platform, please reach out to Amerigroup um, via their TAP email address, which is on the screen. Uh, it's transitionassistancefcs at amerigroup.com. And Joe, um, you know, will connect you with the info that you need. So next, we'll briefly review best practices related to the administration of TAP funding. So I'll just lightly touch on intakes and assessment and highlight the way uh, these processes can spark discussions that help reveal important information to an enrollee's housing search, uh, specifically concerning income and any missing documentation that may be a barrier to obtaining housing. And then I'll chat briefly about the participation agreement, which is required to be signed and dated once by an enrollee prior to spending any TAP funding. Um, and then I'll talk about uh, HHS or, and HQS inspections or housing quality standard inspections and housing habitability standard inspections. Um, you know, those are uh, tools that FCS supportive housing providers should already be performing or uh, in the field when enrollees are moving into a new unit. Um, and, and inspection documentation will be required for moves into permanent housing. And that really helps with a few things that I'll discuss once we get to the slide. And then I'll also lightly touch on the W-9 form and its purpose. So, uh, you know, income assessment tools are beneficial when engaging enrollees for a variety of reasons. And your agency's current FCS intake assessment may or may not include questions about income. If it doesn't, it would be an excellent addition. Uh, you know, walking beside an enrollee as they travel through an assessment can offer insight into income, including the amount and the sources. And sometimes this happens in one sitting, other times it occurs over time. You know, really there's no standard way to obtain this, uh, you know, truly vital information outside of building rapport with the enrollee. And once that information is uh, collected, it's crucial to maintain up-to-date documents in an enrollee's file for quick access. And assessments can be good times to identify areas where TAP can assist. Like, uh, you know, while discussing financial circumstances with an FCS enrollee during an assessment, uh, provider staff can identify areas where TAP funding may be used to lower or remove those financial barriers to housing. Um, you know, maybe it's through the acquisition of an ID or identification documentation, a birth certificate or something of that sort. Uh, maybe it's paying for application fees, um, but other items may pop up along the way uh, that may be a little more outside of the box, like I've mentioned. And so we really encourage providers to use that exception to policy process once it, um, now that it's up and running. Um, the participation agreement must be signed and dated once by enrollees. You'll see a, a photo of it on there, and I don't expect people to actually read it, so I apologize for the small text. But, you know, um, really, uh, you know, verbal consent can be accepted for this, and the document really just provides enrollees with an overview of what TAP is and what the program is not. And so, you know, the program does not make ongoing rent payments, nor does the program provide the enrollee with cash in hand. You know, rather payments need to be delivered by provider staff in whatever way that has been agreed upon. And eligibility is explicitly stated on the document and that the enrollee's participation is voluntary. It also explicitly states that the funding is linked to the FCS supportive housing enrollee and the, that other people uh, do not have the right to tap funding unless they are also eligible to receive funding. Uh, it also reminds the enrollee that they are responsible for the full cost of their housing unless they have signed a contract to receive longer term rental assistance. And there's a sig signature line and date line. Uh, you know, this document only needs to be signed once by an enrollee and the document must be retained in the client's file. Inspections. So, you know, I think the more the most common ones are the HQS or housing quality standards or the HHS, the housing habitability standard inspections. And these are really only used for when folks are moving into uh, or, or using move-in assistance through TAP to enter uh, housing. So it's best practice to perform housing quality inspections, even when other entities must perform them as well, like a local housing authority. And doing this really encourages conversations concerning the apartment's quality, the enrollee's housing preferences, and more. And that's best practice for the FCS program and for TAP. So documenting inspection results is required. Uh, if another entity gets to the inspection before the provider, obtaining a copy that's, uh, that, of that, that entity's uh, inspection is sufficient, 
But either way, a copy of an inspection should be retained in the enrollees file if possible. And we're aiming to ensure that the funding, the TAP funding, is used to assist people with obtaining safe, healthy, affordable housing. Uh, it really can help a landlord also prepare for an official inspection to have this preliminary inspection, if that's kind of um, how, how it happens for them. Um, and it's really to you know prepare for that longer term program to come in and inspect the housing unit. Um, and so a preliminary inspection can help reveal inequality issues. And then, uh, you know, I've seen the landlord mitigation program through the Department of Commerce be a really great tool uh, that can assist with updating units if they do not pass inspection. Um, and the FCS trainers, uh, Kimberly Castle or Ryan Orbaum can connect you with more information on that if needed. So when leasing up, landlords, property management companies, and other subsidy recipients are required to submit a W-9 to providers so that uh, the ownership of property um, goods and services can be verified. This, doc this document also informs the IRS that a landlord has been paid money that counts as income. And so at the end of each year, info from the W-9, including the amount paid, is reported by the provider to the IRS. Uh, you know, providers are to collect, retain, and submit W-9 forms to the IRS for each landlord receiving income from the DBHR short-term housing subsidy. And all information, including a hard copy of the W-9 form, should be kept confidential by the provider. And information from the W-9 should be reported to the IRS, like I said just a second ago, at the end of every year. So this is just another slide touching on the importance or the criticality of checking Medicaid or checking provider one to establish a Medicaid connection prior to spending TAP. So this just says, you know, if, uh, you know, an enrollee's Medicaid is active and FCS eligible at the time of the TAP, uh, proposed TAP fund uh, spending, TAP funds can be spent. Um, if not, they cannot be spent. Um, but once Medicaid is confirmed to be active, you know, TAP funds can only be spent on items up to the amount listed on the TAP uh, quick reference guide. Okay. So next, I'm just going to give a quick overview of best practices and strategies in relation to TAP uh, service provision. This section will contain a review of the importance of landlord outreach and engagement, engaging individuals upon exiting from inpatient settings, identifying barriers to affordable housing, linking enrollees with longer-term rental resources, and then the golden thread of documentation. So scattered site independent housing is often owned and operated by private market landlords, and accessing private rental uh, housing, the, the private rental housing market demands multifaceted outreach and engagement strategies. Landlord engagement requires planning, preparation, and time, and involves identifying, recruiting, and retaining landlords. And so, you know, when resources like the housing stock are limited, uh, performing landlord outreach and engagement can help cultivate creative ways of working with landlords so that they uh, will consider offering units to folks receiving supportive housing uh, services now and in the future. Communication between the enrollee, landlord, and service provider are key to ensuring the enrollee's preferences align with uh, housing op options being offered. So good communication among all entities can truly help resolve issues if they arise. You know, streamlining communication so that line, so that those lines of communications, communication are open and sustainable can, uh, you know, help improve an enrollee's experience in a unit. Uh, this is also particularly helpful when issues arise, but it also helps open landlords up, like I was saying a second ago, to the prospect of providing future housing opportunities to enrollees who participate in supportive housing services. You know. Ultimately, establishing strong connections with landlords supports the well being of program participants, and ongoing communication helps bolster tendencies in the short and long term. You know, plain and simple, um, landlords play a crucial role in the lives of many of the enrollees uh, by offering units that can become an enrollee's home. Uh, and when a landlord is happy or has their needs met or concerns addressed, their happiness increases. And if and when an enrollee is seeking housing, provider staff can help a landlord understand how FCS helps enrollees achieve housing stability, and they can communicate the next steps that will be taken by the enrollee and service staff to secure a unit a landlord is offering. Um, they can express how the initial housing costs will be paid, as well as future rent payments. And oftentimes, long-term rent programs are attractive to landlords because they're guaranteed to receive payment from a program for the unit. So again, ultimately communicating with landlords 
typically makes for happy landlords and a landlord's happiness can further bolster tenancies. And so TAP aims to assist enrollees who are making housing transitions. And this includes folks who are exiting a variety of institutional settings. So for folks who are re-entering a community after an institutional stay, best practice is to provide service flexibility so that a staff person can work more intensively with tenants upon their exit. Uh, provider staff can work with an enrollee to identify their housing preferences and activities in the community that may establish a daily structure or a routine and aim of easing the transition from that institutional setting. Working with tenants to help strengthen and develop their connections with community can also help a person become part of their community by cultivating a strong social support network. And this includes supporting tenants when they express they would like to connect with neighbors, peers, family, and friends. So folks who are exiting institutional care may receive services from multiple systems. For instance, they may be receiving mental health services as well as be eligible for in-home caregiving services. Uh, you know, the lead service provider for supportive housing and the tenant's designated case manager are responsible for working to ensure that the tenant meets eligibility criteria for and receives any needed services. And the case manager must also work with the tenant to ensure that the overall package of services is comprehensive and com uh, complete despite coming from multiple systems of care. And so in this process, the tenant's choices are about the services they want to participate in. And those conversations uh, should always drive um, you know, their, care, their coordination of care and, and service provision. And so all the pieces I touched on require provider staff to develop and establish a strong, uh, as strong of rapport as possible with enrollees. And this helps generate open lines of communication and relationships that assist enrollees with obtaining and maintaining housing security. Of course, the person needs to have a housing goal plan, and this plan acts as a flexible map that guides enrollees and provider staff towards housing goal achievement. And, and enrollees' housing goals need to be updated once TAP is used. Uh, you know, be sure to identify how TAP was used and the impact it had on the person's path to housing identify what was paid for, and also identify any next steps that need to be taken by an enrollee or provider staff, and when those steps will be taken. And lastly, use the golden thread of documentation to provide a comprehensive overview of the enrollee's housing treatment plan. So I'm not gonna spend too much time on these. Uh, these are you know, um, sample case notes, if you will, uh, that, incorporate tax spending. And so it's really just kind of, uh, you know, us trying to uh, provide some information about uh, what we would like to see in a case now when TAP funding is used. And this is for the pre-tenancy stage and then the tenancy stage. And these uh, slides will go out uh, after the session. And so uh, feel free to, to review these slides um, afterwards. So we're nearing the end. I just want to touch on a few critical pieces. You know, uh, TAP funding aims to lower and remove barriers to housing stability, right, um, for all FCS supportive housing enrollees. But some may be entering a unit where they can uh, where they can afford ongoing rent on their own, while other enrollees receive fixed low incomes and oftentimes cannot afford rents in their region. And so, for enrollees that are seeking to use longer term rental resources. Uh, you know, TAP can cover costs that some longer term rental resources do not. TAP can cover first and last month's rent like we, we saw a bit earlier. Uh, we can cover deposits and non-refundable fees for programs that don't cover those costs. Um, we can also cover common pre-tenancy costs like application fees and IDs. Uh, TAP may be able to cover short term hotel motel stays for up to, uh, you know, 30 days, but we approve those at two week in two week increments, just so folks know. Um, and if a person has a long-term housing resource in hand um, and they're searching for permanent housing, that's really where we, we aim to offer those hotel motel stays for folks. Um, the program can also cover costs of certain items upon a person's move, like reasonably priced mattress, uh, a reasonably priced mattress or sheets or pillows, and perhaps a home modification or an accommodation is needed um, and approved by a landlord. You know, TAP could help in that space as well. We really see TAP as a flexible program that fills certain gaps 
And we also hope that you know, supportive housing service providers can link enrollees with longer term rental resources that are available and appropriate for them. And we also know that without available bricks and mortar housing, short and long term subsidies can only do so much. Um, but with that, you know, really what we are promoting here is the layering, the braiding, and the sequencing of uh, uh, rental support and funding support for folks um, in whatever way that person is eligible for these programs so that we can bolster them in housing of their choice. And so um, oftentimes we might see ARPs being used prior to TAP and then TAP uh, bringing someone to CEBRA or the Community Behavioral Health Rental Assistance Program for that longer term rental assistance. So um, just want to highlight that, you know, everyone who is eligible and receiving services for FCS supportive housing or through, through the program has a unique kind of path forward um, with uh, different subsidy types out there, depending on what they're eligible for. So this slide here really just provides a quick overview of what uh, resources are on Amerigroup's site. There is on the main FCS page on Amerigroup's page or on Amerigroup's site, um, a transition assistance program drop down at the very bottom. And you will find these resources and these, uh, you know, or this slide really just identifies what those resources are, are, are providing. A real quick summary slide, uh, you know, TAP launched on May 2nd and we're still going strong. Uh, I believe that we've spent just over 1.5 million um, since launching on May 2nd. Um, just, you know, reinforcing that we were a flexible funding resource and what housing uh, uh, related costs the program will cover. Um, the difference between the, you know, ETP system or a request process versus the, the other process or the no, more normal process. And then just a quick little bit about um, the, the max spending amount of $5,000 per, per 12 months. Got some resources and information. You'll see a lot of FCS resources on the first uh, slide. And then on the second slide, we have more broad resources coming from SAMHSA, HUD, and others, Pathways to Housing and Pathways to Employment. And then my contact information. Um, I, I really want folks to feel like they can reach out to me. Um, I'm happy to meet with providers to talk through things. Typically, when I meet with providers to talk through TAP, uh, I invite Amerigroup uh, because they really do, you know, uh, manage the provider network and the use of TAP and how, how money uh, gets dispersed. Um, and so with that, just, you know, encouraging folks to uh, reach out to me, uh, set up meetings with me if that's what you would like. Uh, and um, we would be happy to, you know, uh, work together to get TAP functioning at your agency um, so that folks can access it. But with that, I know I've been talking for quite a long time, um, and it's 920, so we've got about 10 more minutes. I see I haven't had the chat open, um, and so with that, perhaps uh, I see Don. Don's tracking questions. Indeed, I am, and I can read them to you. And and the good news is we've actually got uh, until 10 o'clock. And so we've got lots of time for questions. Great. <laughs> um, so the first question that I have on the list is, uh, is TAP still paid for by the agency and then billed to Amerigroup? Or can it be requested directly through Amerigroup? It is still the structure and you can request from Amerigroup. So it's it's either. It's kind of your choice at that point. And if you'd like to meet and talk more about that, me and Joe would be happy to kind of talk through the difference there. Next question, where do we go to get the contract and fill it out? So uh, you'd want to connect with Joe um, at Amerigroup. So you'd want to email the transition assistance FCS at Amerigroup.com address and just let them know that your agency is hoping to connect with TAP. Um, once, once they get that email, they'll send you over the, the documentation and, and can work with you on getting it back into them. TAP funding requires an agency to have funds to participate. What if that is not feasible for an agency? So I think I may have answered that one a little earlier. That is not fully true any longer. We did launch in that way, um, but we now allow for providers to access funding um, upfront. That is going to be, you know, making those timely payments. Uh, it's maybe going to cause a little bit of a, a timeline change there for folks to get payments to landlords in that scenario, um, but that's what we have to work with right now. 
Um, would this include money owed to properties? Could you expand on that one? And I'm going to have to have, have whoever asked the questions to expand. Looks like that was Christina. Hi, Christina. Do you mind expanding on that question? Are you talking about past due rents or? Yes. Uh, yes, yeah. exactly. Um, yeah, OK. I just wanted to be certain. Thank you for that. Um, so we can cover past due rents only through the exception of the policy process. And, and we have it set up that way because you know, we, we would, of course, want to see how much that arrearage amount would be. Um, and uh, we typically cover those. But, uh, you know, with that, I just I encourage you to submit an exception to policy request. Uh, next question, is there a specific form for ETP requests or will each agency need to develop that? So you use the same request for reimbursement? Uh, form to submit an exception to policy. And basically, there's a few extra columns that ask, is this an exception to policy? You would put yes for an exception to policy request. And then in the notes, that's where you would put more of a narrative about how uh, TAP funding would bolster that person's um, housing stability going forward or, or improve their housing stability moving forward as they're searching for housing or whatnot. What would be considered a unique barrier? Um, I'll just pull one out of a hat. Someone has a traumatic brain injury. Maybe they just moved into a new unit and maybe there are certain types of things that may um, bolster them in that housing that we uh, as subsidy providers don't know about until we talk with them. So tap funds reset and can be used again. Could you repeat that one, Donna? You cut out for a second. I apologize. Um, so tap funds reset and can be used again. Absolutely. Yeah, so you know the idea being, um, so just to be totally candid, I've been a case manager in FCS before for many years, or three years, not many years, because we haven't been around that long. But um, you know, it isn't always the case that the first housing option works out. I'll, you know, and we, want, we don't want to just give people one shot deals. That's my, that's my approach. I um, had a question about how do I find the link to do the training on TAPS today at 1030? Um, you know, that is something that if you are able, Don, to record that person's email address, I would be happy to forward it to them immediately after uh, today's session. All right. So I'm going to ask the person that asked the, the question to please put their email address in the chat, and we'll make sure to get that to you. Thanks, Don. Uh, let's see here. Can TAP be used to pay a portion of move-in costs, assuming the costs meet other requirements? That is, total move-in costs are 6000 Could FCS be used to reimburse 2000 of that to the agency, or is it an all-or-nothing situation? So again, grade, layer, staff, and sequence in whatever way you feel TAP can be most useful up to the amount that we cap it at. So if 2000 is what's needed at that moment, and you're grading it, with other resources because that's what available to them. That's what's available available to them at that moment. And you know, tap funding is going to be available to them ongoing. Then I think it would be very it would behoove them to to be braiding in that way to maximize funding across the board. Could you repeat what the criteria is for short term hotel motel reimbursement? So no necessary criteria. Per se, it's just more of that exception to policy request. So, you know, again, submitting that um, ETP request via the request for reimbursement um, spreadsheet right now. Um, and then you would say, yes, this is an exception to policy request. And then in the in the notes field, you would explain, you know, the, the circumstance of that person and, and why a hotel motel may be needed uh, to, to further their housing goals. How about short-term storage, not arrears for someone transitioning into permanent housing? I always encourage folks to submit a request. And Darren, it sounds like you've been kind of tracking messages or questions. I have, That's the last one I had on my list. Uh, do you have uh, the point at which? Uh, well, we also have a couple of people raising their hands. So I'm just wondering if we could take a break. I know Dana had her hand raised earlier and then Anthony has his hand raised as well. Yeah, do we want to take Dana first and then Anthony? That sounds good. 
Dana, did you still I have a phone or? With YWCA landlord engagement, and I've had some experiences with utilizing or attempting to utilize Amerigroup for clients in the past where their move in costs and deposits were under 5,000, but then was um, told that it was limited to a certain amount, not to exceed, we'll say, $1,500. And so that's become a barrier. Do you have an email that you could forward me? I just put it in the chat to be invited to the next training. Okay. Um, and I had another question. Uh, can I follow up on that one real quick, though? Yes. Um, it sounds like you were denied TAP. Is that what you're you're claiming um, for an amount over fifteen hundred? Yes. Is that, could you forward that communication to me? Um, I don't know if I still have that because it's kind of old, but. Okay. I can call you when we're finished and discuss it with you. Yeah, that'd be great. And what about when someone is holding a permanent supportive housing voucher and their only barrier to receiving housing, to becoming rehoused, we're going to say, is the past debt being paid mm -hmm. to a previous landlord? Is that something like homeless prevention type thing? Yep. Yep, we do that often. And that's through the ETP process. So would our agency be partnering with TAP or with Amerigroup? You'd have to work through Amerigroup. So this funding, um, you know, this whole presentation was really about how this money goes through the Foundational Community Support Supportive Housing Service Program. And so Amerigroup is the third party administrator of that program, um, also manages the TAP funding, and the funding sits at Amerigroup for, for agencies to access when they're when they're serving someone with FCS supportive housing. Okay, thank you. Yeah, of course. Great questions. Thanks, Dana. And it looks like Anthony has his hand up. I guess hi, everyone. Um, I'm kind of new to this. I have a Trinity Housing Services. We have uh, transitional housing for those that are homeless and those that are coming out of incarceration back into the community. And I, I want to know how I can get involved and how uh, uh, um, the uh, what would be the, the, the benefit of uh, collaborating uh, with the Merit Group and TAP uh, for our uh, organization and program for these men um, coming out of incarceration and, and homelessness. Yeah, yeah. So Anthony, real quick, can I ask, are you an FCS supportive housing provider currently? Or no. you're not? No. How about no, this? That's what I want to know. I want to know how can I get involved? Yeah, that's what I was going to say. So it sounds like um, what we would want to do is connect you with some information about the FCS uh, supportive housing program more broadly. We'd also want to send over some supported employment uh, information as well as FCS has both programs. And <laughs> what FCS really does is enable agencies to start billing Medicaid um, for supportive housing and supported employment services. And so it's a you know, newer funding stream of sorts that would support your agency. And we have a lot of different tools and, and, and folks that you could meet with to kind of talk about how services would look at your agency and how to get them um, stood up. And so if that's something you're interested in, I would love to organize or collaborate you know, and, and bring together some folks to meet with you and talk through some things. I would love that. I would love that. Thank you so much. Would you mind dropping your email in the chat so that I can reference it later? I'm doing it right now. Awesome. Thanks so much. Thank you. And then I see um, I was able to find in the list where the the where I left out question wise. Um, Katie says, I would like to say what a blessing this program has made to the STAR project and our participants since we signed up uh, 90 days ago. Joe Elder's a great resource. Uh, TAP has allowed, a, uh, uh, has allowed us to help three families get into permanent housing and also to cover paint and cleaning costs to bring a unit into acceptable living standards. Thanks, Scott, for a great presentation. Uh, Kristen says, you mentioned hotel motel stays can be covered. Do we need to submit uh, an ETP for those? Exactly. Yep. It's an exception to policy process. And, and currently, we um, may fund um, up to 30 days total in a hotel motel stay. And we only um, uh, allow those in two week increments. So we would approve two, the first two weeks and then another two weeks upon another, another request. And we do that because we really want to maximize the costs. Um, and we've seen folks go into hotel motel stays where you know folks get a whole month paid and then maybe they don't stay that whole time. 
Deborah says, I got an exception to policy request approved for a participant who needed temporary housing to recover from surgery. Three months were approved, but he needs more time to recover. Can I submit a new exception to the rule or request for more time? Always, always, always submit um, if curious. I, I, I encourage folks to continually submit and we'll continually review. Thank you for that question though. Darren, I see the next one is an email address. Are you by any chance tracking the email addresses so that we can get them to Scott afterwards? I'll do that now. Thank you, Darren. Okay. And thanks for dropping that, Dana. And I see Kristen also said, please, please, please involve me in today's training link as well. Okay, perfect. Uh, same with Lene. Uh, that looks like Jeff, um, Hannah. Uh, Teresa, we have a bunch of folks that would like to go to the training. Julia, uh, Anthony, uh, how is TAP different than some some of Commerce's housing grants like CHG? So TAP is housed at the Healthcare Authority and, and is um, paired with someone's healthcare. So that that is a big difference there, whereas Commerce is going to be a broader kind of um, um, you know, that's the homeless grant, consolidated homeless grant that works in the homeless response system. We we work within behavioral health care. And so, um, you know, there is um, a bit of, um, how do I want to say, two systems running along each other um, in ways at the same time. Um, and some people may be working within both. Some may only be receiving, receiving services through kind of the behavioral health uh, world and others may be receiving services in more of the homelessness response world. And so, um, you know, that's kind of the the way the, the landscape looks right now, if that makes sense. Uh, we collaborate um, pretty closely uh, with commerce, but not with the homeless response uh, system folks as much as the, the new Office of Apple Health and Homes and Permanent Supportive Housing. Um, and uh, I would say the 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 biggest funding resource that TAP um, is, is somewhat linked with in certain regions is the Community Behavioral Health Rental Assistance Program um, in a way where that's a longer term rental assistance program um, that typically requires someone to be receiving a housing support service and FCS supportive housing is one of those uh, housing support services. But with that, you know, CBRA is oftentimes maybe only um, available to folks who are exiting certain institutions at a given time. And so just kind of want to uh, highlight that piece. Um, but that said, always working to align better, always trying to work across um, you know, agencies and break down those silos so that we're a little more understanding and aware of what others are doing. It looks like Dana has a hand up and Anthony has a hand up. Yeah, I have one more question. Sorry, I probably have a ton, so I'll try to keep it short. So are the clients that we're referring to Amerigroup, are they required to continue utilizing some sort of supportive service through Amerigroup to, can, to receive the funds? Nope. Nope, they just need to be enrolled in FCS uh, supportive housing um, and, and, and they don't need to be agreeing to services or engaging in services necessarily, but typically to access TAP, they're gonna be going through their service provider, right? Right. So that's kind of the, the, to access TAP, you go through the service provider. So you would typically be engaging at some level in services, um, but afterward, the, there's no condition, you know, just like the permanent house, permanent supportive housing principles state, no, no service conditions or renter readiness conditions um, for TAP. Hmm. Okay, thank you. And then I'm not sure if Anthony's hand up was from, from before or Anthony, did you have another question? Hearing none, um, Jeff's hand is up also. Jeff, do you unmute? Jeff, would you like to unmute so that you could ask your question? There we go.
All right, perhaps we'll catch Jeff's question later. Um, Alexi had said, I work for a nonprofit, but does the Recovery Navigator pro program have access to this funding? Only if they're providing FCS supportive housing services and are contracted to do so. So uh, like they would, the, your agency would need to connect with Amerigroup if you're not already providing FCS supportive housing services. Um, and if you are uh, already providing those services and have a contract with Amerigroup, you'd, you'd need your agency to, to sign the TAP contract amendment, okay? Uh, Lori has a hand up as well. Hi, Lori. Hi, Scott. I have a question and I'm very confused on it. I have a client that, or excuse me, someone called me two days ago and stating that she just got out of prison and she's homeless and she's in a treatment and she's in a treatment program, uh, of course, mandated by DOC. And I tried to get her on my caseload because she said she had state, in, state insurance but they're saying through the state and she's called like three times and I've even talked to other people in our agency to get her some help. And they're saying that her insurance doesn't qualify for help with FCS. Is she, and I hear you saying state insurance? Yes, sir. If on state funded Medicaid, they will not qualify for FCS. If on federally funded Medicaid, they will. That, so the difference there. Um, there okay. Does this person have a RAC code or recipient access code? She does has a number called N01. Okay. Would I you, don't know exactly what that is. We're trying to do some research on it because it's not making sense since she did get out of prison. I thought that she would definitely qualify, you know, so, to get some assistance. So she might be, and, and how about you email me um, with some more details about this if you if you feel like it I would be happy please to, please to, to work on this with you or at least connect you with someone who can um <clears throat> it could be because they're they recently exited and maybe they haven't done everything they need to do to get back onto Medicaid and, and the broader Medicaid um okay uh because something happens with people's Medicaid as they um enter institutions for um, certain lengths of time um and so there could be an issue with that person's kind of transition back into the community and their Medicaid not being on fully yet. Thank you, Scott. I'll email you. Thank you. Yeah, of course. So um, this one says, I have a question about the hotel funding. Are you able to assist with hotel when they are waiting for a unit to pass uh, they are to move into? Or is it uh, that they are homeless and need housing temporarily until we find them something? I, we are typically fund those folks that are in waiting um, for approval. Um, we also see folks who experience certain crises or maybe they just recently exited somewhere and needed a place to stay as they kind of figure out their next step. We consider funding those as well. Um, but typically what we see come in are folks that are kind of on their path towards that permanent housing space that they've already identified and they're just waiting for things to fall into place. Angela asked if the recording of this is going to be emailed to the, to us, and I will be very transparent and say on occasion we have problems getting the recording to save. As long as we're able to, it will be sent out. <laughs> so with that caveat, um, Leanne says, can TAP funds be used to assist a, a client with living skills such as cleaning services to maintain housing? So not necessarily, um, how do I want to say? uh continual cleaning sorts of uh, uh services if you will we have had instances where folks may have uh you know exhibiting they may be exhibiting signs of hoarding disorder or um you know might be uh, starting to have some clutter in their apartment and while uh we we consider funding those i'll say that um and i also like to highlight kind of on the side though that uh, i think it's really critical especially for folks that are um, experiencing, you know, more clutter in their apartment or um, maybe exhibiting signs of hoarding disorder, um, that some behavioral health support is also um, something that I, I just highlight as a potential need as people start cleaning certain spaces, uh, just given um, some of the trauma that can come up and come out through, um, through those instances. But uh, short, short answer to your question, doesn't hurt to submit a request. 
Um, but as far as like continual cleaning services, those are less likely to be something that we'll fund. Um, but would always love to hear kind of your, your take on what's going on there and, and we'll consider it. So Ashley's question may have been answered. It, it says, could an ETP be submitted for a person who needs to move due to hoarding disorder slash high clutter? So, um, did you have more information that, that was needed, Ashley? And Ashley, just a quick answer to that. Yes, we can, we can um, help fund uh, a transition um, due to that, um, just kind of in short. You know, if someone is making a housing transition, um, you know, we're not necessarily concerned about the reason why, per se. Um, we're happy to cover the cost if, if that's what's needed um, for moving costs and whatnot. Kristen said, when you say we need to submit an ETP via spreadsheet, where can we access that spreadsheet? So uh, a little bit earlier, I had reviewed some of the, the items that were available on Amerigroup's website for foundation community supports. You would be able to find the spreadsheet on their website. It's downloadable. Um, and that, just so you know, that spreadsheet, like I've said a few times already, is going to be um, transitioned out or, or phased out, if you will, um, because we're, we're transitioning to an online platform for TAP requests. Um, but for now, that spreadsheet is what's used for the next month, at least. Are there any limitations on how old a rental debt can be or where the debt originated from in order for a TAP ETP request to be approved? Is there any complication if the debt is in collections and no longer with the landlord? No complications on this side. Um, I think the only thing I'd like to highlight um, is that the provider and the enrollee would need to take the appropriate steps to get it erased from the credit. Uh, Jeff says, can someone be approved for a hotel stay even if they don't have an immediate, immediate housing lined up for afterward? Um, they can. Um, yes. Um, but I would, you know, just highly encourage people to be strategic about when you're using funding. Because that $5,000 cap is real. And I do see that Joe said, I'm pulling all the emails right now and we'll send out the invite shortly. Thank you, Joe. Oh, no, thank you. I appreciate it. Glad you're here. Let's see. If a client was housed, used uh, tapped funds, and several months later ends up with past due rent, can an ETP still be submitted? It sure can. Uh, let's see here. What was the name of the longer term rental assistance program you mentioned? It's called the Community Behavioral Health Rental Assistance Program, or CBRA. And the Department of Commerce has a website. Let me try to pull it up and drop the link. Um, they have a link and you would be able to identify who the provider of it is in your region. And I will say, you know, depending on the region, um, it may be simpler to connect with than others, but um, it is somewhat available across the state. I do know certain regions have already um, gone through this this year's amount uh, that they were allocated. So just mentioning those things, but I'll drop the, um, the link in the chat. Can you tell me how many hours we should check in on clients monthly? So that's more of a service question. Um, you know, I don't necessarily know kind of what the standard is. I would, I feel like I'm remembering, um, you know, a five, um, Five, like five engagements throughout a month being something that I think is a suggestion, but um, I don't want to say the wrong thing here because I don't remember kind of what the standard is. So I'm going to try to defer to one of the supportive housing trainers who I don't think are here right now, um, but I can get you that answer. Mm -hmm. But I would also say just from a standpoint of either supported employment or supportive housing, uh, the amount of time you spend with a person is based on need. Yeah. To a, to a great degree. So, um, you know, keep that in mind as well. Um, is the housing quality standard checklist on the Amerigroup Forms website? If not, how could we get a copy? Um, that is something that you could Google and find if you wanted to, because there are ones that HUD uses. Uh, and we have our own healthcare authority versions that if you were to go to uh, the guidelines document, the Foundational Community Supports Transition Assistance Guidelines that are located on Amerigroup's website, 
um, you would be able to go through uh, that document and you'll find links to a few versions of it as well as in the appendix, I believe, um, or no, there, there are links to the HCA ones in the document as well. So um, easy to just go ahead and Google if you'd like. Um, otherwise, uh, you could go uh, to an error group site and go to the guidelines and, and you'll find them. My understanding is that TAP reimbursement is only accepted within 30 days of transitioning. Is this still the case? It is. Yep, submissions should be, um, or, or re requests for reimbursement should be submitted within 30 days of spending by the provider. We are flexible and, on that, just so you know, but it, it, it's really just a matter of trying to get things in as soon as possible so we have a mo the most up-to-date um, balance on the account as possible, right? Sorry to interrupt you, Don. No, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I think I interrupted you. Um, that brings us to the end of the questions in the chat at this point in time. I want to check with Jeff because I know Jeff, you have your hand raised and maybe try to come off mute a bit ago, but it didn't work out. No, Jeff, uh, it's an accidental hand raise. I'm with his agency. I was talking to him, but I do have a question that I put in the chat and I don't think it got answered. I didn't hear it. Um, can someone be approved for hotel stay even if they don't have immediate housing lined up afterward? Um, yes, they can. Um, and I also just highlight that it would be wise to consider that $5,000 cap amount. Um, okay, as all right. I have a, a guy that uh, is homeless and he's part of the program, but he needs to stay in a hotel in order to get surgery. Sure, yep. I, I would go ahead and submit that ETP. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah, of course. And that looks like it's it. And I don't see. I think the hands that were raised, Jeff and Lori, were previous. Um, if not, Lori, did you still have a question? No, I don't. I don't know how to take it off. Sorry. <laughs> oh, no worries. <laughs> Ira, I just replied to your question in the chat, but up to 10 days. All right, everyone. Well, if no more questions, and I don't want to cut anyone off, we still have 12 minutes, um, but if none, please feel free to, to go about your day. And I just want to thank you for coming and, and listening to me uh, talk for a while. Um, if you still have questions, I'm going to hang out for a few more minutes. So uh, keep working on nice, this. Nicely done there, Mr. Scott. Thank you for that great information. Yeah, of course. And thanks for having me. I really do appreciate it. Um, really does make sense to have the, the supported employment uh, providers have all the tools that they need in their tool belt, right? Absolutely, absolutely. Well, and based on the, the original number of folks that were in the, the uh, uh, webinar, obviously the people attending believe that too. <laughs> right, yeah. Okay, um, I, Marissa, you. I see your question. Uh, is TAP only housing, but also employment? It is only housing. Okay, so the, the fund is only accessed through the supportive housing side um, of the house. That said, a lot of agencies provide both services. The services go hand in hand for a lot of folks. And so that's why I'm here presenting to the support employment uh, crew today. That's yeah, really one of the things I appreciate appreciate about the state of Washington is the the fact that um, you know the legislature and and uh, powers that be at healthcare authority recognize how important supportive housing and supported employment are in regards to being presented together or offered together. Uh, you know, if folks consider the fact that people have a better opportunity to select their housing if they've got money to pay rent. And that's that's just you know crucial. Absolutely, yeah. It's it's a really special thing to to be living in a place and working in a place where we understand that housing and employment are part of those health outcomes, right? Absolutely. Looks like questions have ended. All right. Well, I'm going to stop recording.